back to the Afro future, 1965. And I've arrived to roam a pre-riot, pre-cracked Detroit, where the blocks are filled with fathers. And because my teenage dad don't need lessons on game and no brothers named Biff, no meddling necessary. My time free, so I spin wild with Doc Brown. Named- Welcome everyone to Fresh Ink. How are you doing? Happy Friday. I hope you're doing well. Um, thanks for coming and spending this hour with us. Um, it's a great hour. I'm really excited to hear from these writers. I also wanted to mention um, that last week's broadcast, for those of you who, was with that, who, who were with us, we did a, an episode called Art and Activism. Um, some people had asked if they could see it and we have done our first rebroadcast. So that episode is also available on our website. You just heard from Idris Goodwin. That was the music that brought us in. He was one of the two playwrights, him in motion. I also th- think it's really important to uh, let you know that he has done this amazing thing. He's offered five short plays on an anti-racist tomorrow to read with families. You can get to it through our website. Um, yeah, for folks who want to have these conversations with their children, it's a, it's a beautiful offering that Idris has put out to the world. Let's get started. I want to send it off to Guillermo, my co-host. Thanks, Wayne. Delighted to be here again on June 19th. This is a very uh, special and important day historically. For one, it is the birthday of Jose Rizal, the Filipino playwright, author, and nationalist. And of course, today is also Juneteenth, because on June 19th in 1865, the last enslaved African Americans were finally given the notice of their freedom. And so this day is marks the official end of slavery in the United States. And 155 years later today, we find ourselves in the middle of a very exciting, very powerful moment that is dealing with the legacy of that history and is part of the march and movement towards real racial equality, equity, and justice. Tomorrow is also an important day, and that's because tomorrow is uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day. And we at Soul Pepper would like to acknowledge that Soul Pepper Theatre Company is physically situated in Toronto, Toronto, which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And this is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, as well as the Mississaugas of the Credit. They were the first caretakers and storytellers here, and they continue to be. And we at Soul Pepper are grateful to work, live, and practice on this land. We have two fantastic playwrights today, uh, Andrea Scott and Hiro Kanagawa. Hiro is joining us from the West Coast, and he would like to acknowledge that it is his honor and privilege to live on the core ancestral territory of the Tsleil-Waututh and Coquitlam First Nations and the shared territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Katsi First Nations. Hiro is a van... I'm just gonna give a brief bio and then I'm gonna turn it over to you, Hiro. Um, Hiro is a Vancouver-based actor and writer. His play, Indian Arm, received the 2017 Governor General's Literary Award for Drama. He is a television story editor and he's worked on shows that you'll know like Da Vinci's Inquest, Intelligence and Blackstone. His plays, uh, Tiger of Malaysia, The Patron Saint of Stanley Park and numerous short works have been performed across Canada, and Hiro, we're delighted to have you with us here today. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure entirely. Um, I just want to throw in that it's on Sunday, National Indigenous Peoples Day. I'm sorry, I'm one day ahead. I'm (laughs) I'm already in my weekend. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that. So Hiro, what have you got for us today? I'm going to uh, present an excerpt from a one-man musical journey um, it's something that I've started uh, here during this COVID lockdown, and it's uh, my reflections on privilege and discrimination growing up as a Japanese kid in Canada and, and the U.S. So I'm going to present a little excerpt from that for you. Great. Turn it over to you. Thanks. Na na 
first word I spoke in Canada. I was three. We just landed in Toronto. And when we stepped outside the airport, the first thing I saw was a long black limousine with tail fins gliding like a dream. And to my three-year-old Japanese eyes, it looked for all the world like the Batmobile. For a while, we lived in Guelph, on Terry Ariario, in an apartment over a shop with a Michelin man in the window. And those days were hard, especially when school started and all I wanted was to not be Japanese. Just like the stereotypes, I could not pronounce my L's and R's. The onigiri wrapped in seaweed that my mother made me for lunch was disgusting to the other kids. They said I smelled like fish. They called me flat face and Jap. Jap electronics were shit in those days. Jap cars were a fucking joke. They were clown cars. Sure, there were other non-white kids, but people seemed to like them. People liked Chinese food. And the kids from India were beautiful. Their eyes were big and round and their noses were the same as the white kids' noses. After a few years, we moved to Sterling Heights, Michigan, on the white fringes of Motown, and life actually improved for me. I mastered the language, and kids played baseball, which I was good at. Mostly, we just ran around and played dodgeball and tag, and I was fast. For the first time, I was popular. There were a couple of black kids at our school. One of them we were friends with but one of them not so much. Sometimes I'd see him off by himself looking at me, jealous of me. And without being able to put it into words, I realized he was who I used to be, not included. One day in fourth grade, my teacher wanted to talk to me after school. She was a white lady, Ukrainian American, I think. And she gave me a letter to take home to my parents. We were going to be studying about Pearl Harbor. And she wanted us to know that she was going to do everything she could to make sure nothing happened to me. She would not let anyone tease me or bully me. And she would make sure everybody in her classroom understood that I was their friend. And I had nothing to do with the war. This was 1973, less than 30 years since the end of World War II. There might have been kids in my class who had grandparents or uncles or even fathers who had fought in the Pacific. But none of that mattered. My teacher made sure of it. That's my America. That's still the country I think of when I think of America. But later that year, during summer vacation, I saw the other America, the one that's broken, that's failed, the one that lurches like a gunman shot on a dusty street, twisting his face into a mask of hate. We went on a family road trip that summer to California and back. Yellowstone was on the itinerary, of course, Disneyland, Mount Rushmore, Las Vegas, Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, all of America that a Japanese family could pack into three and a half weeks. A Japanese family that was also going to stop at every single Flintstones cavern and Apache trading post and roadside dinosaur fun park along the way. Because like most kids that age, I was heavily, heavily into dinosaurs and crystallized rocks and flint arrowheads. 
anything that came out of the ground that was old and mysterious and you could hold them in your hand and look at them and the greatest excitement was when you could kind of see what they were when they were alive. I had every Scholastics book club book about fossils and stone tools and I had read every entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica about archaeology and paleontology and anthropology. I knew everything there was to know about all of that. What I did not know as we drove through the Dakotas is that there had been an uprising that spring and summer at a place called Wounded Knee and that all through the American West tensions were high and people in the small towns we passed through weren't used to seeing a carload of Japanese especially Japanese who were as dark-skinned as we are in my family. Everywhere we went, people kept asking us, hey, what tribe are you from? Some of it was plain curiosity, but some of it was not. My father, I guess, had been warned by his white colleagues or had just figured out on his own that it would do no good in these situations to say that we were from Japan. So he would just tell people that we were from Michigan. Sometimes that didn't go over too good. I wrote a song about that road trip. Most of it is kind of true. Japanese family on a vacation, 1973. the badlands in a rust colored ramble with my family on our way to Yosemite Disneyland and all points in between we will run off the road by two good old boys in a cam engine Camaro at first I thought it was my fault because I had waved at them. I asked Okachan why they done, what they done. She said, Shin Pai Nai, the only drum. But I heard the good old boy say, if some bitches would try by you from, now get your red asses back. Husky stand under a big sky dusk. So a man and his daughter in a pickup truck. Two coyotes dead in the back. Shotguns cross the window rack. The man said to dad, What tribe are you from? Dad said, Oh, we're from. Michigan And the man he looked at us and said Didn't know Michigan still had any Indians All right Here we go now I heard your people shot some G-men the hell out of wounded knee well we won't stand for this year rings erection you'll hang like dogs i'll be waiting in the jury box down in rapid city petrified trees I'm looking at him he's looking at me 
I just want to be you. Do you want to be me? Rolling across Montana, a rust colored rambler with my family. On our way to Yosemite and Disneyland, dead winter. Fantastic. Huh. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Hero. Wow. That's, that's very moving. I was going to change my background. Oh, yeah. Tell us the about song. this. Tell us about this photograph. This is a photograph from that road trip. That's me in the foreground there. And uh, there's an indigenous boy in that teepee who was selling stuff he'd found in the desert, you know, little pieces of petrified wood and uh, crystals and arrowheads and so on. And, uh, you know, he was uh, about my age. I mean, we looked at each other and, you know, you know, as you can see, you know, uh, we're pretty dark skinned in my family. So it was one of those, uh, moments from my childhood uh, where, you know, there's this uh, awareness, I guess, of privilege. Uh, and then looking at him and the conditions that he was living in, uh, also, I guess, becoming aware of what discrimination really was. And, you know, this piece that I'm writing, I think the one of the things that I really want to get to get at is um, even though I'd faced discrimination as, as a Japanese, someone of Japanese ancestry, obviously, you know, in 2020, the Japanese now are honorary whites in the club of whiteness. Uh, we are among the more privileged and, um, Looking back over my life, I have to say that, uh, you know, as I related in this song, the worst racism that I have faced, the most dangerous racism to my person was when I was mistaken for indigenous. Right, right. Um, so this moment here in the song, there's this kind of uncanny moment of recognition in some way of like, not that you had the language for it, but that you, you saw that um, semblance between you and yet the difference between you. Is that, is that fair to say that? Yeah. And, you know, and I come from uh, the northern island of Japan, Hokkaido, which also has uh, an indigenous people, the Ainu. So um, I don't know. I mean, and I've always, and I, I'm married to an indigenous woman now. So throughout my life, you know, there's, you know, uh, there's just the obvious uh, uh, physical recognition that you have. You see, especially growing up in North America, there really weren't, you know, where I was, a lot of other Asian kids or, and certainly not a whole lot of other Japanese Americans or Japanese Canadians around. So growing up, there's always that, you know, you see someone who looks vaguely like you, right? There's a kind of curiosity and, um, and uh, yeah, as you say, a recognition of, well, whoa, you know, we're, we seem like we're the same, but, uh, but then, you know, you realize you're not, that there are these, invisible barriers of privilege and discrimination. Yeah, well, one thing I, that struck me as really strong, even in that brief excerpt of text, was the way um, you quickly reveal the complexity of um, my, the my, minoritized experiences. Like there are these, all these kids at school who are othered in some way, yet they're not a homogenous mass or they're not a unified a group. There are uneasy alliances. It's shifting. There's hierarchies. There's 
there's suspicion. It's always being judged and weighed and played mm -hmm. against the dominant um, culture. Mm -hmm. I, I remember as a as a young kid, as a as a as a Latinx kid, looking for kids who were like me, uh, or not looking for them, but listening for them. Um, and that was hugely significant when you met somebody who was remotely, you know, was remotely in some way similar. A very that that need for, um, yeah, recognition to, to right. feel that you're you're there. I'm I'm wondering, um, what brings you back to this material now, uh, today at this point in your life, and and how difficult is it for you to revisit this, or um, what's what's it like for you? Um, it's funny, I've, you know, um, I've played guitar since I was, um, 14. So for over, over 40 years now. And, um, you know, probably my first aspiration as a writer, as an artist was to, you know, be Bruce Springsteen, you know, when I was in high school. Um, and, uh, it's something I actually kind of pursued through high school and college. Um, but then I, you know, I didn't pursue it after that. Um, part of it is just this whole COVID lockdown and having the time to um, reflect on my life. Um, part of it is uh, an awareness that the plays that I was writing pre-COVID, it's going to be many, many years probably before they're able to be produced or see the light of day in any form because... Um, I was actually pre-COVID really starting to do large scale pieces with immense cast and immense production values. And, uh, you know, fortunate to have some support from theaters to do that. But um, obviously that is something that is very far in the future now. So uh, yeah, so during this COVID lockdown, um, looking to do things that were more personal, uh, more personally meaningful to me and, and smaller that could conceivably, you know, be done in a format like this or in a small house with, you know, 25 people or 50 people or whatever it is that they allow us to do. And um, children too, I have two kids just before the COVID lockdown my daughter came home from, she's 11, and we live in a very diverse area, you know, she's obviously, she's uh, half Japanese, um, and there's so many kids in her school that are half Asian or full-on Asian, and, but she came home from one, from school one day, and she said, Dad, some kids at school asked me, uh, are you Asian or are you Japanese? And, you know, it, was, it wasn't any malice or, you know, anything like that. I mean, she thought it was amusing, as did I. But uh, there is this thing about the Japanese identity, right? Like we are, we're Asian, Canadian, Asian American, but we are also uh, a separate category. I mean, and it just goes to show, I mean, you know, you say Latinx, we say Asian American, Asian Canadian. It's not a monolith, obviously, right? By any stretch. So, um, and then it's especially the last two or three weeks with all of the protests and demonstrations, um, you know, and the fact that, uh, you know, George Floyd's uh, killers, uh, aside from Chauvin, you know, the guy who stood, stood guard there obviously he was an Asian American gentleman uh, and he was married to um, an Asian woman. So there's uh, very complex feelings of complicity. Uh, and once again, acknowledging the fact that even though on the one hand, I can be considered a minority, a person of color, on the other hand, Japan is a G7 nation uh, Japan was an ally of the Nazis. Japan was had honorary white status in apartheid South Africa. Um, so there are all, it's a very complex uh, situation to be 
someone of Japanese ancestry in our world. And these are things that I want to unpack and talk about because I think that the Japanese experience can actually illuminate some of the other conversations that we have around race. Right, right. Um, yeah, it's incredible, as you say, it's incredibly complex, especially in the terms you're putting it now. Uh, one of the things that strikes me that's so effective about the piece, and I could see it working so beautifully in a small theater, because it's so intimate and honest, is also that that's, it's not quite a child's perspective, but there is a some, some that that child's openness and just looking at the world kind of going what is what is this exactly there isn't we haven't made decisions yet we're and so as an audience we're forced to listen to that carefully and we interpret we go oh my god that's what that is that's what's going on we make a judgment on it um i, I want to take us to a, a question from the audience i think waney has one of those for us for you I do. It's from <laughs> Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Question for you, Hiro. Wondering if Hiro ever talked to his parents about this and what their experience was and what did they say to him? Will I ever talk to my parents? No, I wanted to know if, if you had ever told your parents about what happened and what their reaction was in this particular story when you were a kid. Uh, I No, you know, we don't, as with many Japanese families, uh, we we don't talk about things right and they they live in japan now i think that if they lived and still lived in north america uh that would be a more um perhaps relevant or or a more you know immediate conversation to have with them but they live in japan um, my sister lives in oregon and uh i think that you know with my sister we very definitely have these conversations about identity. She used to live in, she's told me she used to live in Montana and, uh, you know, and she would get profiled going into stores, you know, when she, she's very granola and when she had long hair and it was braided and so on. Once again, you know, she, she didn't face racism as a Japanese American woman. She faced racism because you know, she would walk into a store and they would assume she was, she was native. Right. Um, can you give us just the tiniest, this is Wounded Knee we're talking about when you, when you were traveling, is that correct? Do wounded you, Knee, you, yes. Yeah, can you give us the tiniest little um, context for, for those of us who don't remember exactly what Wounded Knee was? So in uh, 1973, in the spring of 1973, uh, there was a, an uprising at Wounded Knee uh, and uh, a federal agent was uh, shot. And uh, there was, it was around the time, you know, there were all kinds of movements, right? There was the American Indian movement. Uh, there were all kinds of, uh, as with, as now, it was a time when there was a lot of uh, movements, social movements, uh, trying to find, trying to seek, uh, justice, racial justice uh, in American society. And um, so, you know, and Wounded Knee has significance also in that uh, in the time of the, you know, of the Indian Wars, there was a very large massacre there, right? So, but uh, there is a, I, I think the actual uh, Indian reserve there is called Pine Butte. And, um, what essentially happened was that the uh, federal agents, it was just basically held under siege for many, many months um, until, you know, the, basically the federal government forced the people there to, uh, to, to end the siege. And, uh, but it was, uh, you know, so for many months, there was a lot of tension. And, and as we were traveling through the American West, uh, about a month, a few weeks to a month after that, that there were still all these tensions about it. And people wanted to know if we were the tribe that was, you know, the Sioux who were involved with Wounded Knee or if we were some other tribe. Right. Um, would you say, do you feel that you have a responsibility? Uh, you, I mean, you talk about, you, you've sort of mentioned Japanese 
are honorary white, uh, that you verge on race neutrality in a way. Um, so do you feel, is that a, is that problematic? Is that a useful position for you to work from or to write from? Is, do you feel a responsibility with that? What, um, what, how does that affect you as an artist? I do feel a responsibility. I feel that all of my plays up until now have been about the relationship of different groups to the central culture of whiteness. And um, the responsibility I feel now, especially these past two or three weeks is that we need to dismantle um, a racialized view of society. We're never going to get to racial justice or equality unless we can somehow dismantle society being uh, organized on race. You know, when race is the organizing principle of society, we're never going to, because we're, humans are inherently hierarchical creatures, right? So, I think uh, one of the things that I find fascinating is the absurdity of the social construct of whiteness, especially when you think of the ways in which the Japanese have been <laughs> accepted into the club. It's all about economics, right? Um, there's nothing about biology or physiognomy which allows apartheid South Africa to accept the Japanese it's because the Japanese were buying five million tons of South African pig iron you know there's nothing about the Japanese which make them Aryan for the Nazis it's just the fact that the Nazis needed an ally in Asia so uh, again I think that by unpacking the ways in which the Japanese nation and people like me can be accepted as privileged members of the club of whiteness, we can start to see the ways in which the whole thing can perhaps be dismantled. Right. Um, my last question, and it's about this piece and where it's, where it's at and um, how will you continue to work on it? Well, actually, before I say that, I just want to say what I love about what I've heard so far is that we, you, it's this American road trip. It's kind of classic. You've got Disney, you've got Yosemite, you've got this, but it's a different map because in the middle of this is Wounded Knee. Like it's a mm -hmm. different, it's like it, 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 among the attractions, there's this calamity. Uh, and also the song, like the, the, the sound of this music is kind of very American folk and some, you know, Neil Youngish kind of in there. And yet it's got this subversive lyric working through it. It's kind of, I love the way you're rewriting Americana in a way. Um, and so I'm wondering where it's at how how much longer and how how are you working on it like are you writing daily are you are, what's what's your process um i think that you know as with this little bit that i presented today there will probably be seven or eight songs and then um a narrative a text that that contextualizes that song um and I don't know that the whole, I don't think that the whole piece will stay in my childhood. Um, I think, you know, it will jump around to, uh, to cover various events from my life where uh, I have been racialized by the society or I have, you know, or I've had an incident in my life where race has been, uh, the issue. So um, I think that is kind of the, the grand vision for the piece. And um, in terms of the songs, I think that there's, uh, you know, already four or five of them that are that are written. So um, yeah, I, th I think it's pretty far along. And, uh, you know, hopefully, maybe by the end of the year, there'll be a first draft. Amazing. I uh, look forward to seeing it soon, I hope. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks, Hero. And thanks for the conversation. Really important. And um, mm -hmm. um, 
we will continue to talk and you know it'll be interesting to see how we connect to this next piece which i think great uh, well yeah we'll, have, we'll be able to continue to have this conversation very much with andrea scott hello my friend happy to have you here um for all of you who do not know um this fabulous lady her name is andrea scott she's a professional actor playwright and producer she's produced eating pomegranates naked which was, uh, it won the RBC Arts Professional Award and also won a bunch of other prizes at Summer Works, including Outstanding Ensemble and Productions. Uh, it also happened again when she did Better Angels at Summer Works, which also won a bunch of awards, including Outstanding New Play and Outstanding Production. Um, also, if you wanna hear that play, uh, Better Angels is available on CBC Podcasts. Go to Play Me and you can hear it. Um, Don't Talk to Me Like I'm Your Wife, when the kale turn in Shernin Award, mm -hmm. yes, uh, for theater, and uh, and her most recent show, Every Day She Rose, co-written by with Nick Green and Control Damage at Neptune Theater. Um, sorry, her recent show, Every Day She Rose, was co-written co with Nick Green and Control Damage, which is another play that pa played at Neptune Theater, which um, had the little buzz fact that it sold out its three weeks before it even opened. Welcome to Fresh Ink, Andrea. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, I'm glad to have you. Um, yeah, how you doing? <clears throat> well, uh, it's been a it's been an interesting week, um, but uh, knowing that I was going to be doing this and uh, with the what's happening in the world today, I've been grateful that I've had this script to work on because uh, it's just focused my energy and helped me block out all the, all the grief and the trauma that's been happening um, outside of my, outside of my door. So mm -hmm. I, I've been doing okay. And, you know, I make sure that I give myself breaks, sit in my backyard and uh, have a cocktail with my friends. And uh, I, I try to only turn on my phone or my laptop uh, at noon. I try not to be on my phone in the morning scrolling just to keep, uh, maintain some sanity. Mental health. Mental health. Yeah. Mental health. Yeah. Yeah. It's helped yeah. a lot. Yeah. And it's, you know, we, oh, I hear some weird feedback. Where's that coming from? Hmm. Uh, yeah. It's been a, it's been a question for us at, you know, Fresh Inc., Guillermo and I, and we've all talked about, you know, we took a pause um, to give the focus to Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's happening, all the conversations that are happening that's so important. And then we came back last week and it's been uh, it's been interesting to know what to do. And I, I think uh, after last week's Fresh Ink, it was really clear that art is one of my weapons. And this is, uh, it's important to be able to hear all of you artists at this time, you know? Yeah. So what are you going to read for us today? I'll be reading from a play that I've been kind of working on for a bit uh, called Born Afraid. Uh, it's a play that I was inspired to write after I saw a Long Day's Journey and Tonight at Stratford in 2018. So it kind of has the same kind of structure. So it's a uh, same day, same set, same five people that you'll see. And it's a family in uh, little Jamaica. So it's a mom and a dad and father and so mom, dad, brother, sister, and then a neighbor. And so what I'm gonna be reading is a scene. Uh, it's the second scene in the play. And this all takes place on Jamaica's Independence Day, which is August the 6th. And there's gonna be a big celebration. So this is a scene between dad and his daughter, Rachel. All right, of course. Okay. Rachel walks in without Richard seeing her and she hears the last part of him talking. Daddy? He turns and looks at her. Hey girl, who are you talking to? Talking to yourself? No, there's that dog, you know, the one that just sit down there and bark. I've never heard any dog. Richard pulls out a small box from behind an armchair and begins removing small Jamaican and Canadian flags. He plants them all over the living room and eventually pops one into her hair. So we need to make this place look more Jamaican. You know who's Jamaican? This is an old call and response that immigrant kids know. Who? Rihanna. No, daddy, she's not. Yes, I see it on the internet. We should play some of her songs today. 
why do you, what is the big deal about Independence Day this year? You've never made a big deal about this before. It's my anniversary of what? Of when I moved to this country. Oh, and it almost never happened. You know, I think you've already told me this story. I was supposed to move to Chicago because that's where your mother's brother, Irving, lived. And my cousin Lydie lived 20, 20 minutes out of town. And everyone wanted to move to the United States, especially me. So 34 years ago, I'm ready to go. But see here, they won't let me in, all right? I get off the flight and them say, no, go back home. <laughs> So I get back on the plane, fly back to Montego Bay, talk to some people and friends, and here I am, Toronto, and I love it. I love it so much. I don't ever want to be buried, not, not back home, okay? I want to be buried here. And you know what? I never regret not moving to America. I mean, look, look at that place now. You couldn't pay me, okay? You get cigarettes, they kill you. You sleep in your car, them shoot you up. You pay by check and them foot pan your neck. Uh, 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 buy it better here. Well, unless you're indigenous, what? Or a mentally ill black woman who gets pushed off of a balcony. Uh, here you go again with your talk about crazy people. Mentally ill doesn't mean crazy. Listen, if I had ended up in the States, who knows what would have been, would have been like, huh? It's a scary place, man. All right, United States, mm -mm. I only call them the States now because there's nothing united about that place. If they hadn't sent me back, maybe I'd end up dead or in jail. And, and you, you would be in the nut house, okay? Who can say, you should be happy I brought you here. So you left the year I was born. Uh, yeah. Shortly after, yeah, yeah. But you know, things happen, you know. I didn't plan that. Yeah, because I wasn't planned. <laughs> planned. That's a white thing. Babies just happen. You were a surprise. Huh? Everybody like a surprise. Not if it's chlamydia. What? Nothing, nothing. I, I have a surprise for you. You won the lottery. Ha, <laughs> I wish. It'll happen to you before it happens to me since you're the only one buying tickets. You can't win if you don't play, Rachel. Eh, these tickets you buy me today. Uh, how you pick the numbers? Quick pick. It's easier. Ah, so that's why I didn't win anything. Rachel, you have to pick the numbers yourself. Shark can't never win you nothing. Okay, work harder to win the lottery. Got it. So thank you, by the way. Thank you for buying the tickets the last couple of weeks. I promise to pay you back when I get my pension or when I win the lottery. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I, I have something. I have something to tell you. You have a man now. What? No. What? What would? What would make you think that? I don't know. You haven't been around much. You know. When you are home, you stay in your room and you always run out of here when your phone ring. I figure some big love affair. I'm moving. Moving what? No, I'm. 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 I'm moving out. Is that why you're pulling your book off the shelf? Well, nobody here reads anyway, but why? They're my books. No, no, no. I mean, why are you moving out? Well, because I'm a middle-aged woman. I am not middle-aged. I'm a middle-aged woman living at home with her family. And because I, I should have my own place by now. I'm 34. Should. Mm -mm. That's ridiculous. You'd rather pay rent in the city than live with your family. I, I will be paying rent. Also, I bought a condo. I have money to buy a condo. I've saved a lot. I've saved everything that I make. And you know, I've always worked like a ton of jobs and I never go on vacation and I never buy clothes. And he's like, you never buy a lottery ticket. Yeah. I've seen you and mommy renting your whole lives and going with you on endless walks in model homes. And you could never afford that. And I knew you wouldn't be buying, and I just didn't want that kind of a future. Sorry, nothing wrong with dreaming, Rachel. You have a roommate? No. So, no boyfriend then? 
that's what I said. I'm doing this by myself. I'll never live with another man unless he's going to be my husband. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you always did a bad taste in men, eh? Yeah, and whose fault is that? <laughs> what do you mean by that? It, nothing, nothing. I Listen, I just wanted to tell you today because it's Independence Day and, and I'm moving out on my own, finally. So you're moving out. You're moving out to live alone, pay a mortgage in this expensive city when you already have a roof over your head. Is that right? Yeah. You're working three jobs to buy a place you barely live in. I quit my two other jobs. When? Uh, three weeks ago. I got a promotion at my full-time job and a raise. Oh, uh, yeah? How much? I can move in next spring. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be leaving in about nine months, nine months from now. Okay, so with this raise, uh, you're still able to, you know, help us out, you know, with the rent here. I mean, when you move out, I, because with me not working and Maggie on disability, it's already really tight, you know, so I'm, I'm sorry, daddy. I'm sorry, I just, I can't. All my money is, it's been spent on the condo and the lawyer and the, the title insurance and property tax and furniture and all the, okay, 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 okay. It's all right, it's all right, okay. We just have to cut back a bit, you know? Spend $10 upon lottery instead of 20. And, and maybe we get Simeon to pay a little bit of rent. I'm sorry, Simeon hasn't been paying rent? He used to throw us a couple bucks here and there, but you know, he has no job and, he hasn't worked in months. He was a security guard for like, what, a, like a few months? You know, it's hard to find work now, Rachel. And yet I managed to have three jobs at the same time. <laughs> yeah, you're real, real Jamaican for true, girl. No, 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 no jokes. Daddy, am I the only person in this house that's actually working, bringing in a paycheck? Well, you know, your mother get her disability and I get my pension and your help was good, man. You know, Sim is just, you know, you know, your brother. Life had been hard for him since he got back. Oh, oh, you always make excuses for him. And mommy, you defend and you defend their mistakes, their, their laziness. And I get punished all the time for not, not doing enough. That, that is why I'm leaving. I can't do enough here and be appreciated appreciated. But since when you need appreciation, we're a family. You don't get a thank you for doing the right thing, okay? What? A family? Huh? I'm an afterthought. Simeon and mommy are your family. What you talking about? You forgot my birthday this year. No, I didn't. I never forget your birthday. Yeah, you all did. Your birthday is July 6th. June! What? June 6th. Well, oh, wait. D-Day, remember? You used to always call it Daddy, Daughter Day, but this year you forgot. But you never see anything. I was just, I was too tired. I'd worked a double shift and then the warehouse and I, I just knew it wouldn't matter. So, you know, my father never remember my birthday. Never, not once. With my mother, Imab, 14 picnic, me the youngest, the favorite. I never see him, but I know he was a bad man because I'm running around town with all kind of women. Me have like 15, 16 more brother or sister. Me don't know. Now me, me never look at another woman as long as I've been married to your mother. She was it. She was the only one. You know, I hate it when you call Margaret my mother. She's not my mother. Claudia, who is still in Kingston, Jamaica, is my mother. Now you talk foolishness. What, what foolishness? That Margaret is not my mother and has never been a mother to me? Or that you left my mom after, you, after she had me? And as soon as I had my landing papers, I sponsor you to come here. You would not be here with your fancy education and put on ears if you hadn't moved to Canada and had a much better life. Who says my life wouldn't have been good in Jamaica? I would have been raised by someone who at least loved me. Ah, uh, how you know that, huh? 
How you know she wouldn't just pawn you off on her mother like plenty picnic in Jamaica? Uh, uh, you don't. You don't. You see? You see how hard it is to raise kids in this country as a single mother? But it never crossed your mind what it's like in the island. You know how many picnic raised by them grandparents? Plenty. At least here, you had me, you had Simeon, and you had Maggie. Full family under one roof, but you're still not satisfied. Why are you never satisfied? She never treated me like a daughter. I was a, I was, I was never wanted. She never wanted me around. I was a nuisance. Got in the way of her raising Simeon. She raised you. What? You think you raised yourself? I wasn't around as much as I should have been, but ah, that was the time, you know? Men work and the women take care of the picnic. That's it, okay? It wasn't like it is now with men walking around with the, the baby on them chest. Like, I don't know, man. Raising the kids was her job and she did it. And I'm telling you, she raised one of us. Look, when you were all little, she was the one who woke up before all of us, make us breakfast, make our lunches, for me to take to work and you to school, okay? She walk your boat to school, help you with your homework when you ask, because she was the smart one between us. I can admit that now. She made sure we had dinner every single night and you would never hear her talking about having some kind of a, what is it, a, a personal day and order something like pizza or hamburger or any of that crap food. Because she took care of us. Before she do anything else, she put us first. You don't see that? You don't see that as raising a family, raising you? We never got to eat any of those foods because you never let us have it, daddy. You called it white food and you didn't like anything that wasn't cooked at home. And so what? You and Simia, you'll grow up healthy because of it. None of your fat, none of your smoke, have heart attack or nothing. You don't have no baby outside of wedlock. See me not in jail or mess up on drugs? What do you want, man? Love. Love? <laughs> what? Why is that so ridiculous to you? What we gave you was love. Maybe not the way you want it, but it was there. Well, if I didn't feel it, then it wasn't there. You did a shitty job. Rachel, that's not nice. You both loved Simeon, but only you loved me. And even then, I didn't feel it. Maggie, Maggie love you. I mean, she, she does it in her own way. Well, uh, that does not help me. Children need to know that they are cared for and protected. And, and I always felt like a nuisance. If I didn't want you, would I have brought you to Canada? How many men have dozens of picnic they never see? It happened here in the US, in Jamaica. Caring for your children isn't optional and it, and it shouldn't be. Oh, I care for you. Why you see, I don't care. That, I, I, that's not exactly what I said. Yes, that's exactly what you see. Paying for me to be here and putting a roof over my hair, head is not parenting. Yeah, well, where I come from, it is. Nice. <laughs> Nice. I was looking at the chat and people are saying, my dad, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it, uh, yeah. So to, yeah. I want to know something before we uh, talk about these particular characters, which I'm very yeah. intrigued by. Uh, you were sitting in that, in that theater and you watched Long Day's Journey. Yeah. And, and what was it? What struck you? And uh, did you know right there you wanted to write that play? No, no. I just was like, I think after I, I went home, I was like, you know, this is a classic piece of, of theater. Um, it keeps getting remounted. People really identify with this, this dysfunctional, messy family that struggles to love and forgive one another. I was like, how come I never see any stories like that about Jama like West Indian or Black, Black Canadian families? Like, I want to see that. I want to see the messiness. I don't want it to necessarily be a comedy. Um, I, I want people to say the things that they shouldn't say to each other. But you know, West Indians sometimes they they don't sugarcoat things, and I think that would be a really great story that I could tell um, using the experiences that I've had in my family and that my family's friends have had and my friends have had. And I thought uh, there's a rich there's a tr there's a very rich tapestry there that I could I could definitely exploit. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it was based on Eugene, it was based on Eugene O'Neill's life loosely as well, right? So how yeah. personal, can I ask that question? How personal? You can ask, you can ask. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is loosely based on me and my brother and my father. Um, like you, you only get to, that scene, you only get to see the dad and the daughter. Um, and I would say actually that my, my relationship with my father is kind of like that. Um, but the mother in the, in the play is not like my mom. My mom and I get along very, very well. Like, there's no animosity or anything like that. But I have seen that kind of really tense, kind of mean, it not, doesn't feel loving relationship between uh, sometimes West Indian mothers and their daughters sometimes. And I just know how harmful and hurtful it is. But because it's honestly, it's so true that immigrant families just sometimes we just don't know how to communicate with each other at all. Um, it's really, really sad. So I wanted to, I wanted to really look at that in this play. Did you see Trey Anthony's play, Black Mothers Don't Say I Love You? I ended up missing that one. And oh. I know that that was that, that the same theme. It's one of those, it's a trauma that we all experience. A lot of us do anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always wondered in my own family, it's just also like, we're not very overt with our emotions in that way. Um, if it was about the the focus when we were growing up on that, that they had to be making it also, mm -hmm. you know, that, 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 that the communication, like it should look at everything I'm doing, you know, yeah. it yeah. should be obvious. I don't have to say articulate it in the same way. Um, where are you and how fast did this come out considering that there were some prototypes that you knew very well? How fast did it come out? Um, I started kind of jotting down ideas um, probably in 2019 and just kind of fleshing out who the characters were um, because I decided to take a very different approach in creating my characters. Sometimes I just sit down and I can just write the play. But this time I decided to really create the characters and write extensive backstories for every single character, who they were, where they were born, um, what their education was, how they personally feel about certain issues. Um, so I spent a lot of time working on who are these people. Um, and then I knew that it was going to be Jamaica's Independence Day and it was going to be a very, very, very hot day in August. And this was gonna be the day that Rachel, you know, tells her family um, and that I knew eventually that the air conditioner was going to break down and that there was gonna be a brownout and that everyone's tensions were gonna get heightened even more. And, um, and then at the end of act one, I knew that Rachel was gonna get some very, very bad news that's going to change the trajectory of her life. So I knew that was going to happen. And then I just, you know, just started writing bit by bit by bit. We've had a couple of people today in the chat and also, a comment here from Sandy saying, um, can, can you play all the roles yourself? A lot of people <laughs> voting for this to be the Andrea one woman show. I will never do a one woman show. <laughs> I think anyone who can do it and do it well, bravo to you, but I will not. <laughs> well, I do want to know as an actor, you made that switch. Um, and I remember reading a quote uh, that I pulled up a year and it's, it talked about why you did move into playwriting and that you saw, um, although I never, I've never written a play before, I felt that I could create better parts for women of color since I knew what we wanted to be allowed to attempt on stage. Yep. How was that transition for you, writing your first piece? It has been fantastic because I get to write really complex, sometimes unlikable characters, but also make them three-dimensional and have the, the audience really engage with them and understand them. Um, and in a way I do, I guess I kind of write the, the roles for me because I, I act them in my head. Like I am acting when I'm writing. So I, I know how I want the, I know the cadence of the voice. I know where the pauses are supposed to fall. Um, I know what roles I would probably love to play if I still wanted to act. And so that's how I have created these really great roles. And I also do seem that, to find that the characters that I end up playing or writing, I should say, are women who, who push against the grain. They're always the women who are doing exactly what they're not supposed to do as deemed acceptable by society. And in this play, this is a woman who is not doing and not just not making her family happy by doing what she wants instead of what they want, which I think a lot of, I feel like a lot of West Indian women have a tendency of putting themselves last. And I wanted to have a woman who has been putting herself last finally say I'm done I'm doing this for me and then how that lands and resonates within her family 
So that's interesting. So as much as you were attracted to sort of um, the chaos of sort of the Tyrone family, the Eugene O'Neill story, here you're you're attracted to that. Like I guess one of the issues being communication, but also her agency, yeah. like how to solve it. Yeah. Yeah, because one of the things that I remember um, having a problem with when I saw Long Day's Journey and Tonight was I remember the next day chasing Bob White down the hall and being like, but who's the protagonist? Who who am I supposed to care about in this play? I, I don't understand the structure really. Like I know that it's, you know, unity of, of place and blah, 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 but I, I'm not really sure um, how this play really works because it does feel like they're repeating a lot of beats in it. And uh, Bob was like, Never been a favorite play of mine. <laughs> I just can't stand that play. And I was like, okay, all right. Well, I'm going to try to find it. It is the dramaturge at Stratford. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Some people talk about it as a meditation. You're that you're there for three hours and you're really getting to experience his life. And how long yeah. do you see this play being? Is it is it a three hour long day journey? No. 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 I don't think. No. No. I mean, I lo I loved. Like I loved being there, but I was like, I don't think this play needs to be three hours. Like I am doing, definitely using a lot of the same structural ideas that he did, which is, you know, so act one starts at I think 7.30 AM and then scene two, it's like lunchtime. And then act two, it starts with in the middle of the day. And then scene two of act two, I think it's like just after dinner or right before dinner. And then act three, like there's, I'm not, I'm not doing exactly that, but I am definitely making sure that there are times and there's, there's jumps in the day. Mm -hmm. So yes, but it, I, I can see this play probably being two, two and a half hours at the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In some ways, both of you here, here are talking about sort of a, a pivotal point in a young person's journey, right? Mm -hmm. There's some ties between your, your work in that way. Mm -hmm. um, what are some, do you know the end of this play? Have you yes. finished it? You do. I do know how, the, I, I know exactly how it's going to end. And uh, do you usually know that when you're writing yeah. a play? Yeah, I do. So you yeah. kind of beat it out like a TV writer in a way. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> I know exactly what's going to happen. And um, another thing that I wanted to make, the thing that I did differently with my play that's not in Long Day's Journey is, you know, in Long Day's Journey, there's Kathleen, the, uh, the house girl. Uh, I, I chose not to have a Kathleen house girl, but there is a Millicent who is a uh, PSW who lives upstairs, who has been very good friends with the family. And she's, she's a Filipino and quite beloved by the family who has her own like little secret that's going on with the family. And she ends up being someone that Rachel can really confide in. And I, I liked the idea of it reflecting Toronto. Like I have a lot of friends who are Filipino and I think that there is like a, a connection between the black community and the Filipino com community. And I wanted to really show that. Mm. Yeah, for one being the, the domestic program that happened for both black and Filipinos. A lot of interesting trajectory, historical trajectory that there, that's, that's interesting material. Yeah. Um, I wanted to open it up to both of you. Oh, first of all, Guillermo, did you have any questions before I opened it to both of them? That's no, you took my question. I did. <laughs> We're morphing I was, into one. I, well, actually, I have, do have, a, both of you are actors. And I know you sort yeah. of answered this, Andrea, but both of you are actors. How do you find, like, do you think about that when you're writing? Like, do you, what I mean is, do you think about actors stepping into these things and going, okay, I really, I know what an actor wants and I gave him, I, I gave him that. I try, yeah, I do try to do that. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm very comfortable letting go of my work though. So I know what I want, I know what I can see in my mind, but every time that I've had a play produced and a cast comes in, they bring the most beautiful subtlety and color and musicality to the play that I could never have imagined. So I kind of feel like I'm, I'm giving them a really good foundation to work from since I do write with an actor's voice. And I, and I know how I want the words to sound coming out of their mouth. And I specifically feel like in this play, I want this play to feel like a symphony. So that's how I am layering it and the voices and the characters. And I'm, I'm really excited about whoever ends up playing these roles. How about you, Hero? Um, I just wanted to ask Andrea, Yes. You do you do you do you still act? Because you said earlier, if you were, you know, you seemed to imply you weren't interested in it anymore. No, not really. Oh, <laughs> so do you write for yourself, or did you in the past write characters for yourself? No. 
no, because never. I don't either. I never, no. I've never explicitly, you know, written myself apart. Um, no. For the same reasons that I think you talked about just now, um, Guillermo. I, I don't know if this will answer your question, but um, I don't ever, you know, well, this one man show obviously is going to be for me, but, uh, you know, previously I never wrote characters for myself. I never envisioned myself in my plays. Um, but I think I am completely informed by being an actor in terms of uh, how I write dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a year, uh, let me think now, about maybe seven years ago, I was at the um, Stratford Playwrights Retreat. And I remember uh, one of the, there was a, sh a woman who's a Shakespearean expert and she came to speak to us. And she was, you know, one thing she said, which is absolutely true, is that the words are meant to be spoken, right? And um, I think, you know, and she she talked about how the actors come in and they've, uh, you know, they've, they're off book and they're so impressed with themselves, but they've never actually spoken the words out loud. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think a lot of the times with writers too, they, you know, they write plays, but they're not speaking the words out loud as they're writing them. And and I think that helps if you if you are an actor and you have that sense of you know what the words sound like when you know like you, if you're an actor you're obviously going to do that. But I think maybe even as an actor we kind of get into this rut of like just writing the words and not actually speaking them out loud. And I think mm -hmm. that's very crucial. Right. Great. Yeah, I think I thought we would zoom out as well, just in like in light of the moment that we're in and here you're speaking to it a bit and everything else. And, you know, we are, we're asking big questions around, you know, we're sort of, sort of a, I described it last week as a global reckoning and I've heard lots of people say that um, around our, our systemically, not even just, you know, um, about what plays are on stage, but, what are your thoughts about that as writers who have been um, working in this field for a while, getting your place produced and everything else? What are some thoughts that you have um, just to reflect on your own journey and how maybe your hope or things that you think could, your suggestions or ideas around what could change still? Well, most of my plays um, are usually have an underpinning of politics and usually are racially uh, focused and how a black life interacts with the world and fits in the world or is rejected by the world. My last play, Control Damage, was specifically about that. Um, and this is this is actually a play that's not, this is a, one of the things I really love about this one that I'm working on is that it's not a play about blackness in opposition to whiteness. It's a play about how we just have our own struggles and we're not talking necessarily about racism. But the thing is, when I was working on this play, COVID happened and then the uprisings started happening in the United States. And I thought, well, I, I can't not reference any of that. I'm going to have to return to this play and find a way to interweave it in a way that makes it organic without it sounding like I'm like kind of ticking a box. So um, it, it works all the way through the play um once you read the entire play that it comes up about our place in the world and what it's like to be a low-wage worker and be valued or to be called a hero while someone cuts your wages and sort of feeling like cannon fodder and how that affects your psyche mm -hmm. you know any thoughts from you um, yeah, I you know I mentioned earlier that all of my plays have been about um, the relationship to the culture of whiteness. Uh, and that still remains true. I think I also think about now my career as a writer from, you know, the bigger picture of like, where do I fit in in the theater ecology professionally? And there are two, two things that um, were said to me that I've that have always resonated with me, and I've and I've tried to figure out my relationship to them. One is uh, I had an opportunity to do a play in San Francisco. It was a premiere of a play by Philip Khan Gotanda, who is kind of a grandfather of uh, Asian American theater. You know, he's had so many plays done since the early '70s, and this was ten years ago that I did uh, a play of his at ACT in San Francisco 
on their main stage. And I, and he told me that it was his first main stage production of his career. And, uh, you know, and that he was absolutely sick of being, as he put it, studioed to death. So, you know, that, I think there is that, you know, up until now there has been that thing where there's the ethnic ghetto in Canadian theater and in American theater where the plays that are written by diverse playwrights get put on the studio stages. And uh, so that is something that um, I did not want for myself at times in my career. And uh, I made a deliberate choice to not write Japanese Canadian plays um, because, and that because of another, you know, quite a quote that resonated very much with me when I was younger. It's a Joy Kogawa quote. Uh, in an interview, she said, Lord, I'm so tired of being a professional ethnic. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a position that I did not, that I very much resisted when I was younger. So uh, those two things have kind of guided me when, especially when I was younger, but now that I'm getting older, I'm kind of making, you know, well, this is who I am. The stories that I took, this is who I am. These are, you know, I got to speak my truth. I can't worry about what the world is doing or how the world is going to, you know, am I going to be on a main stage? Am I going to be in a studio? I can't worry about that now. I just got to do my work. Hmm. So how present was that voice in your head when you were writing? Pardon? Like how present was that voice in your head when you had, when you, in your history, when you've been writing plays, yeah, well, as I said, there was there was a period when I deliberately shied away from from the Japanese Canadian or the Japanese American experience, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. Indian arm, you know, uh, has nothing to do with Japanese Canadian or Japanese American experience. Uh, Patron Saint of Stanley Park, it's a Christmas play, has nothing to do with that experience. Um, but, you know, the play that I was writing just before COVID was a stage adaptation of uh, Mark Sakamoto's Forgiveness. And that was very definitely for me, my entry back into, uh, you know, essentially the Japanese Canadian and Japanese American community. And uh, that's been highly rewarding to me. And that's really taught me a lot about, um, you know, who I am and where I fit in and uh, the stories that I want to tell now going forward. How about you, Andrea? I mean, Andrea, you're obviously a great actress, a great writer, but also you're a very savvy producer. How often has that come into your brain? I mean, it's funny. I think that what happened with me is I just had a very naive about theater when I first wrote my play and it did well um, back in 2013. I was like, well, my play did well. So now all the theaters are going to come running and they will want to produce me. <laughs> Nobody came running. And I was like, okay, I'll write another play and I will produce it myself. I learned how to produce. I understood how to you know, deal with equity and contracts and marketing and advertising and how to raise money. And I just kind of thought, you know, this is the way it should be. This is like, I don't, I, I never felt like I was a put upon artist because I had to produce my own work. Um, I was like, this is a good play. This is a great story. People are gonna like it. I'll put it on myself. I will find the right actors who believe in my work and hire them and pay them. That was another thing. I wanna make sure everybody gets paid and gets paid well. And um, and just use the free platforms that I could to get my work out there. So I made sure that I learned how to use Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. I still use print. I'm a big fan of print and mailing things to people so that they also have something they can put up on their fridge. And it's it's just always reminding people that I am present. And, uh, and you know the the first play that I fully produced myself was Better Angels, a Parable, and that was a play that won Production of the Year at SummerWorks and all the accolades, and it did all it did well and it made all this money. And I said I seem to have a knack for this. And part of it is that my past is I used to work in a lot of corporate organizations, and I was always um, an administrative assistant and so I, an executive assistant. So I am very organized in a business sense. So I know how to do that. And I believe, and this might sound like I'm not being very precious about my work, but I mean, you always have to remember that your play is a product 
and you need to have an audience of people who want to buy that product. So how do you make something that's so desirable that they will leave their house, spend money, sit with you for 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, and then want to tell their friends that you have to come and see this. And with each play, I've been able to get better and better and better at it. And I just, I'm one of those people who just thinks that it would be great if you could just be a playwright, but it really helps if you know how to advocate for your, your work, um, how you can speak to other organizations to explain to them why it's a benefit to have your work on their stage and why it will look good for them. And it has worked and my plays have, you know, they've done okay. So a young person, a young person comes to you, a young black uh, writer or a young Japanese writer comes to you and says, I, you, you know, I really just, I want to write, I want to get on a big stage. What do I do? Uh, write your play, um, apply for uh, grants. Uh, specifically, the recommender grants are great from the Ontario Arts Council. That is how I started. And I, I have to give credit to Be Current because Be Current gave me my very first writing grant in 2011 for a tiny, tiny play. And I could not believe it when I got the notification that my play had been accepted, that they, they were gonna give me, I think a thousand dollars to help me work on my play. And what I have found is that the more places you send your plays to, to get uh, recommender grant money, the more people who see your work, get your work out there. Don't wait for it to be perfect. This idea of perfection is stopping so many artists. Get it down, do a couple of drafts, send it out, Get, get some money, contact those artistic directors, ask them what they liked about it. And in my case, quite a few theaters would then invite me into their playwright unit and then we would work on the play and get it better. Have readings. If you can't afford to hire actors, what I would do is I would like invite my friends over, order in really, really good food and make sure that there was like lots of wine and we would read it and they would give me notes and they would say, this is what works and this doesn't work. And I don't understand this part. And that would help me as well. And I just find that this idea of the, the solo genius is, it, it's not helping any of us and that we have to work together. And it's all about the relation. So no, really, you will always think that about direction. Just, just write it, work with people, Take the, take the constructive criticism and do not um, take it personally. There is a question for you from the audience, Andrea. Yeah. Um, uh, Solo wants to know if, uh, he said, you, you, earlier you said you always knew the ending of your play and, or the outcome of the play. Have you ever been surprised by an ending or a character in one of your plays? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, when I wrote Don't Talk to Me Like I'm Your Wife, um, there was the ending that I thought was gonna happen ended up changing as I was typing. And I remember just, I remember actually stopping and going, oh, oh no, I can't write that. I can't write that. And I think I, I got teary and then I stopped and realized, oh no, that's exactly why you have to write it. And it was always a really great moment in the show because it actually made everyone else in the audience gasp. Cause I would go to most of my shows and I, I feel like, yeah, sometimes your, your, your characters have an idea of what they want to do um, and uh, supersedes what you thought you wanted to do. Just checking the, the chats. We, we Guillermo and I tend to get really involved and we, we ignore the audience questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say about, you know, knowing your ending, it's, it's a really useful thing to do. Like, to gives you something to write towards. It's really easy when you're writing to like sort of wander off, I would say wander off into the forest, you know, in 82 different fascinating directions. But if you have that end point in mind, you write towards it. Mm -hmm. And as you discover, and as you say, it can change yeah. or it can, you discover, oh no, that's, it's a little further this yeah. way, or it's more this way. But having that end point keeps you kind of on the path yeah. as opposed to just sort of, I'm writing, you know, like, I'm, I'm still writing seven years later. I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. I think that, I find that uh, not helpful, not just in the macro, but in the micro in terms of like on any given day, knowing what you're doing that day, you know, knowing what the end point is for that day. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for me, you know, because I have kids and I got, you know, so many distractions, I have to be really efficient with my time and I can't be going off on 82 different 
tangents all the time. So I like, you know, it's very good for me to, to know the end point of any given day in writing session as, as well as the, the macro end point. Even if it does change, you know, mm-hmm. it still disciplines you a little bit. Okay, well, we just have a couple more minutes, but I do, I do want to just one more thought just about this moment, just because it's on everyone's mind. People are thinking, right, this is, it, you know, I think some of you might have seen the We See You Watt, W-A-T, I don't know, but We See You White American Theater, mm-hmm. which was a, a large letter that went out to all theaters across, and it had um, over 300 people uh, of color um, and indigenous folks uh, signed uh, talking about how the changes that, the things that they basically saw and the changes that they were looking for. Um, what did you, when reading that, did you have any reflections for Canada and around specifically around access and and for you as a writer or for what you think about for the generation to come? I mean, it's hard and it's been hard. And I think it will continue to still be a, like a a difficult journey for people. Um, because I think most of the theaters in this country are just not set up for the diverse voices that exist within the theater community. Um, And it can be dispiriting to feel like you're not being heard or um, they might want you to kind of, uh, how do I put it, like uh, soften the edges a little bit. You know, like my play, when I describe it to people, I'm like, I'm writing a very black play. It's very Jamaican. I want there to be accents. Um, I don't necessarily want it to be a comedy so that people feel like they can be like, oh, we can't relate to these people. They're making us laugh. Um, And I had to get to that point. Um, I want to write the play that I want to write. And then I want people to want it, regardless of the fact that I am black or I'm a woman or like I check a box. It's just it's just a very difficult industry to. To feel good in sometimes. Absolutely. I remember when we were creating um, Blood Clot with Young. Are you hearing that feedback? Is it just me? You are? Okay, no. Uh, we were doing Blood Clot with Debbie Young, um, and it was all written in Jamaican language, it's all written in Patois. And there was some requests for us to make edits at points. <laughs> and, uh, and that was a really great battle because, in fact, it just, we just went further in. Um, and it was like, oh, what it needs is more authenticity because obviously we understand specificity is the universal. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and she won the Dora for that play. It's and it also was- the thrill of language. Like, yeah. I remember Blood Club. I, I lo- that show was so fantastic. But part, I mean, just, I mean, theatrically it was a thrill, but uh, on the acoustic level, on the musical level, listening to that speech is thrilling. Um, we want to hear a diversity and plurality of voices, right? And that implies a diversity and plurality of stories. And, um, but I mean, you know, who was it? I can't remember. Somebody said, you know, every time the English language is in trouble, an Irishman comes along to save it, right? Like the the Irish voice, the Irish (laughs) rhythm and poetry, but it's the same with all the other Englishes that are out there. They're incredibly rich. They're delightful to, 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 um, to listen to. And this, this insistence, we have to flatten all our tongues. You know, we have to tame all our tongues to one kind of standard grammatically correct uh, English is a betrayal. Uh, the, The way we speak is so closely connected to who we are and how we feel and how we think. And that's surely what we go to the theater for is to get in touch with other modes. I will never know what it's like to be you, but I can sort of come close by listening to the two of you. And mm-hmm. part of that is the music of what you're up to. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember Lisa Codrington's play, like, like she got, she was punished in the papers for, um, I can't remember the name of it now. Cast but- Iron? Cast, cast iron. iron, cast iron. And mm-hmm. it was like, this play is exclusive. I'm not allowed in. This is the death of multiculturalism. And what you saw there was that what multiculturalism seemed to mean to some people or to this particular reviewer was, I need to understand everything. You need to be transparent to me. Mm-hmm. I just think in the theater, there's so much room for so many different things to go on, for so many different kinds of conversations at different layers. And 
anyway. It, and that got nominated for a Governor General's Award, just yeah. saying. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that's the thing, it, it goes on. I mean, you know, I, I really think about the fact that a lot of this has to do with history and the way that it's recorded and retold, you know? It still blows my mind that, that before I was born in the year I was born, uh, the Doras was swept by an all Caribbean Midsummer Night's Dream produced by Black Theater Canada. And, you know, these are things I didn't even, I don't, I, I had, because of research, you know, and it's like, it's still sort of, I remember growing up and seeing like a, a full black show getting a, you know, winning all these doors and still feeling like it was groundbreaking. And it's mm -hmm. like, you can't continue to keep breaking ground, you know, it's not like, it's a, it's a question of also how we retell our stories and how we retell our, our, our Canadian theater history, you know. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. do know you look in the encyclopedia if you look it up you know that there was actually black theater companies here in canada since the early 1900s yeah. so it's a question of like keeping accounts as well right mm -hmm. any last thoughts from you here before we wrap it up oh this has been a great great conversation and uh i think that uh you know i think we have to as we've been saying in this conversation we just have to uh find a way to uh, dismantle this idea of there being one kind of neutral place, uh, which is the main place, and that is, that's not going to move us forward the way that, you know, we have to think about it is it's not a central neutral place, but that it's, it is in fact a multicultural uh, mosaic with different voices and uh, different music. Mm -hmm. Love it. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you all at home for hanging out with us. Big, big thank you to our wonderful writers. Follow them, check them out and uh, send us messages. Let us know what you thought. Send us comments, uh, questions that you have for them. We'll always forward them along. And if you, if there are other playwrights that you want to hear from, let us know. We will, we will ask them. All right. Goodbye. Bye. I look up at the crowd for the first time. They give that look only aggravated black folk can. This is the era of harmony. Hendrix has yet to shred metal. They don't know about black noise over the measure. Only black noise in the dark. Hell, they not even wearing afros yet. Guess y'all not ready, I say. But your kid's gonna love it.